you. And Commissioner Spellbrink. Bob Spellbrink, uh, representing District 5, uh, Select Oregon. And Commissioner Hatfield Hyde. Good morning. Um, I'm in Congressional District 2, and I'm just really happy to be here today learning about this. Thank you. And Oregon's newest commissioner, um, Khalil, would you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Kathy and Khalil. Um, I represent Western Oregon. I'm excited to be here as well. Thank you. Welcome. And it looks like Director Melcher is back on. So will you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Thank you, Chair Wall. And uh, good morning. Apologies. I had to reboot my computer there. So hopefully I don't have to do that again. But uh, um, I'm Kurt Melcher. I'm the director of the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I'm here sitting in my office in Salem. So looking forward to today to this, today's presentation. And I uh, want to thank all of you for taking the time to join us. Thank you. Um, and Michelle Tate, will you introduce yourself and um, thank you for all your organizing and operations to put this together? Well, thank you, Mary. My name is Michelle Tate and I am the executive assistant for the director and for the commission. And um, I'm glad that we're all here today. Thank you. I think we're ready then. Um, and we'll let commission or vice chair Woolley introduce himself as soon as he gets here. As I mentioned, the purpose of today's meeting is to get an update on marbled merlet in preparation for the July hearing and decision on the question of uplisting those birds under Oregon's ESA. We do have an executive session um, listed on the agenda that we will um, break from our regular meeting and do that if we need it. I'm not sure if we will or not. And um, before we go to staff, it looks like Vice Chair Woolley is here. So will you introduce yourself, please? Good morning, I'm uh, Greg Woley, and I'm commissioner for the Portland Metro area, which is Congressional District 3. I'm sorry, I'm on a slight delay. I log on to my desktop and it started installing a software update. And so I said, oh, yeah, I have to go use a different device. So anyway, happy to be here. I, I think I was a, a little bit of a motivator for this workshop to happen because this has been a a significant issue for a lot of people and I really wanted our commissioners to really get up to speed um, before we have to make some really important decisions. So uh, thank you Chair Wall for, for hosting this. You bet. So let's turn to Director Melcher. Would you like to say anything before staff starts on this or any introductory comments? Uh, thanks Chair Wall. No, I just uh, go ahead and let the staff proceed and we'll get the day underway. And then of course we'll have a full day tomorrow. So hopefully we can get out of here, get you all out of here uh, by the scheduled noon closure today. So Thank you. with that, um, I'm not sure who from the wildlife division is gonna start, but I see Martin Nugent on my screen. So Martin, Andrea, and Rod Kramer, as well as Kevin Blakely may all have roles in this presentation. Good morning. I hope you can see our introductory slide to, just to check to see that's all working. Yes, it is. It's working. Right. Martin. Good. Good morning, Chair Wall, Commissioners, Director Melcher. For the record, I am Martin Nugent. I'm the Threatened, Endangered and Sensitive Species Coordinator in the Wildlife Division. Co-presenting with me today will be Kevin Blakely, Assistant Administrator for the Wildlife Division. Next. For today's presentation, I'll begin with introducing you to some general biology about the species. Kevin Blakely will then provide you with the current listing status for marbled merlets in Oregon and outline the reclassification decision framework through the Oregon Endangered Species Act. Next. Through the next few slides, if I can use that old fashioned term, I'm going to discuss some of the known biology of the marbled merlet. This presentation is intended as a high level summary outline. The department's biological assessment for the marbled merlet will provide you with far more detail and will be sent to you next week. Next. The mob merlet is a small diving seabird in the Alcid family, or commonly called orcs. 
It's a close relative of puffins, murres, and auklets. Like its relatives, it has short wings and has to fly at high speeds to remain airborne. The species has gray-brown plumage during the breeding season, that's April through September. This cryptic coloration helps it blend in with its nesting habitat. Outside the breeding season, mullets have a more black and white appearance. Unusual for a seabird though, marbled mullets spend most of their lives in the marine environment, but fly inland for nesting, mainly in trees of coastal older forests. Due to their secretive behavior and, el and elusive nests, marbled merlets have been long been referred to in the ornithological world, world as the enigma of the Pacific. And we still have much to learn about this species. Next. Marbled merlets breed along the Pacific coast from the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, south through central California. They also winter throughout this range and as far south as Baja California, California and Mexico. As you can see in the slide here, there are three genetically distinct population units. Firstly, Western and Central Aleutian Islands. The second one, Eastern Aleutian Islands to Northern California. And the third in Central California. The bulk of the global population of marbled merlets is actually found in Alaska and British Columbia. The distinct population segment designated by the US Fish and Wildlife Service under the Federal Endangered Species Act is from the US Canadian border through to central California, overlapping all of Oregon. Next. The marbled merlet is a native species to Oregon. It is found nesting mainly in the coast range and Klamath eco regions in the state. Marbled merlets have been detected up to 80 miles inland in Oregon, but most breeding behaviors indicative of occupancy or nesting have been recorded within 50 miles of the ocean. It's important to note that no systematic surveys for marbled merlets have been done throughout their inland range. Most surveys have been performed in conjunction with timber sale planning on public lands or for specific research projects. This map shows detections of merlets from audiovisual surveys in which birds were recorded as exhibiting behaviors below the tree canopy, which would be indicative of occupancy or nesting. Actual nest sites are very difficult to find and have very seldom been found. Since 1990, only 89 marbled merlet nests have been discovered in Oregon. These data were compiled from several agency databases and Oregon State University and were, were collected at, at various times over the last few decades. Next. For many years, the marbled merlet represented what was perhaps one of the greatest ornithological mysteries in the Pacific Northwest. Although it had been long suspected that merlets nest in inland forest areas, the first well-described marbled merlet nest was not found until 1974, and that was in California. Nesting habitat associations have been examined by multiple authors and at various scales. A full review is beyond the scope of today's presentation, but far more detail is provided in our species status assessment. In brief, however, merlets have specialized habitat requirements. They nest primarily in late successional and old growth forests. Since merlets do not build a nest as such, the presence of platforms with moss, lichen, or other substrates create a nest cup. And this is particularly important as a habitat feature. The female lays a single egg, as shown in the picture, in a depression in the moss or other material on a large deformed tree branch. The male and female of the pair take turns incubating in 24 hour shifts until the egg hatches. Once the chick is a couple of days old, it's left unattended as the parents uh, commute to the ocean, uh, bringing fish for the chick. Chicks fledge between 27 and 40 days old. 
at fledgling, young birds must fly, to the, fly from the nest all the way to the ocean alone. Based on what we know, they do not receive any f- further parental care. An unknown percentage of recently fledged marbled merlets do not make it to the ocean. Next. Forest stands occupied by marbled merlets for nesting in Oregon are mostly old growth, mature, or areas that naturally regenerated following past fire. High densities of large trees with platforms, multiple canopy layers, and small natural canopy gaps that provide access appear important. Merlets are not the most nimble of flyers, so they need small gaps in the canopy to land near the less to land near to the nest site. Most nests in Oregon have been found in trees older than 80 years old, though nesting has been documented in younger and mature trees with structural features like deformities or dwarf missile infestations characteristic of older trees. Nest sites often have vegetative tree cover above or to the side, which probably helps conceal the nest from predators. Outside of incubation, merlets tend to visit nests mainly at dawn or dusk or in low light conditions. Overall, predator avoidance and the energetic and flight capabilities of merlets have likely influenced many of the aspects of their nesting ecology. Next. Marbled merlets forage and resting areas in Oregon are generally concentrated in the nearshore ocean, typically within 1.2 miles of the coastline during the breeding season. Merlet distribution at sea during the breeding season is strongly correlated with these large blocks of suitable nesting habitat nearby but they do move to patches of better feeding opportunities, especially after a failed breeding attempt. Merlets are more widely distributed or dispersed during the winter months, but we know little about winter distribution. Next. Like other alcids, marbled merlets are wing propelled pursuit divers. They capture small schooling fish, such as herring, smelt, anchovies, sand lance, and marine invertebrates beneath the surface by quote unquote, flying underwater. Marbled merlets are thought to be flexible foragers, feeding on the most abundant suitable prey items. They generally feed on small larval or juvenile fish, but select larger fish to feed their chicks at the nest likely because of the high energy cost of nest sea commutes. Prey quality and availability are affected by large scale oceanographic processes from seasonal aspects of the California current system to to interannual changes such as El Nino, La Nina and longer term regime shifts like the Pacific decadal oscillation At the more local scale, distribution during the summer is strongly influenced by the local and intensity of ocean upwelling. Next slide. Marbled merlets are relatively long lived and have delayed sexual maturity and low reproductive output. They lay only one egg per clutch and re-nesting rates are low. They may not breed every year. This low reproductive potential requires high survivorship of adults, sub-adults, and young in order for the breeding birds to successfully replace themselves over the course of their lifetimes to yield a stable or increasing population. We have limited data on vital rates for Oregon, that is vital rates refer to things such as birth and death rates that tell us how a population is changing. Low next, no, low nest success and low recruitment of young have been reported wherever data are available across the federally listed area. In Oregon, nest success has been estimated at roughly 36%. In Oregon of 22 nests with known outcomes, eight were successful. In general, 
Nest or fledgling success likely reflects the co a combination of factors, such as predation pressure and ability to find and deliver adequate food to chicks. Next. At the time that the marbled murlet was state listed in 1995, Oregon Park of Fish and Wildlife identified a number of natural and human induced threats and factors that could affect the species reproductive potential and continued existence in Oregon. We re revisit these factors in the department's biological assessment and evaluated a number of others, but I'll briefly outline a few here. Next. Marbled mullets have experienced past habitat losses due primar primarily to timber harvest. It is also the distribution and quality of remaining habitat that is important. How far inland, how isolated, how fragmented. Nesting habitat is highly fragmented in Oregon and most of it persists on private lands. Along hard edges at forest clear cuts, for example, there may be higher predation risk, greater wind throw damage, and changes in moisture that could affect moss or lichen growth used as nesting substrate. Fidelity to bre breeding areas, as well as the time it takes for habitat to develop and grow, may limit the ability of merlets to colonize new areas, at least in the short term. Reduced quality of habitat has reduced the availability of trees with key characteristics within optimum locations for, for, for successful nesting. Next. Disturbances have always played a role in shaping forests. Because current habitat is now limited and disconnected, severe disturbances have the potential to remove key patches that cannot be replaced in the near term. Fires, windstorms, disease outbreaks, impact otherwise protected nesting habitat. Some of these disturbances, as we are only too aware of, can have a very significant impact to forest habitat. For example, fires have made a big impact in recent decades, impacting thousands of acres of state and federal lands, including some marbled merlet nesting habitat. The general consensus is that fires are becoming larger and more frequent in the West. Next. Marbled merlets feed exclusively in the nearshore ocean, a vital resource to maintain body condition for survival and for breeding. Merlet breeding success appears to be positively associated with cooler ocean temperatures and a greater abundance of forage fish. Because merlets are long lived, short term phenomena such as El Nino events or a year with poor ocean productivity may not adversely affect marbled merlet populations over the long term. However, merlets may not be able to cope with decades of unfavorable conditions or increased variability in prey resources. During the breeding season, reductions in prey quality or quantity may lead, lead to nest abandonment, abandonment or complete failure. During the pre-breeding season, merlets may, feel to, may fail to initiate nesting site nesting altogether without sufficient food resources being available. Centennial shifts towards lower quality prey types have been well documented in both California and the Salish Sea in Washington. Oregon's coastal surface waters have warmed an average of 0.5 degrees Fahrenheit per decade over the last half, over the last half of the 20th century, and that warming and that warming trend is expected to continue. Harmful algal blooms, low oxygen dead zones, biotoxins, contaminants, and fishing pressures have also potential to affect marbled merlets, though the magnitude of their effects is uncertain. In the six years 2013 to 18 were all considered quote unquote bad years in the ocean with warmer conditions than average. Next. Predation on eggs and nestlings, particularly by corvids, that's jays, crows, ravens, 
is recognized as a major cause of mobbled murlet nest failure. Corvids and other generalist predator populations have increased as a result of human activities and land use change. Forest fragmentation may contribute to elevated predation rates by increasing pre predator densities or activity along forest edges. Anthropogenic food sources from campgrounds, trails, picnic areas, or other human settlements in or around marbled murlet nesting habitat can also support more predators. Next. Marbled murlets are especially vulnerable to oil spills because they feed in local concentrations close to shore and spend most of their time swimming on the sea on the surface. Exposure to oil can impair, can impair thermoregulation flight ability, reproductive behavior, and or physiological functions with lethal or sublethal effects. A spill could also affect their prey resources. In 1999, the new Carissa cargo vessel that ran aground and split apart on the Southern Oregon coast released over 70,000 gallons of fuel, killing or injuring over 2000 seabirds, including 262 marbled merlets. This spill has had the greatest documented merlets mortality in Oregon. A large, oil, a large scale oil spill remains a serious threat given the volume of shipping traffic along the Oregon coast and Columbia River, as well as ports, facilities, and oil trains in Oregon. Next. Finally, to climate change. There are currently few indications that marbled merlets south of Canada will see benefits from a warming climate. Given their low reproductive potential, specialized habitat requirements in both terrestrial and marine environments, breeding site fidelity and restricted distribution, marbled merlets may not be as resilient as some other species to changing conditions. There is already strong evidence that climate change is affecting ecosystems in the Pacific Northwest and globally. Under even the most optimistic scenarios, Oregon's climate is expected to warm at least two to five degrees Fahrenheit by 2050, and by two to seven degrees Fahrenheit by the 2080s. In the coast range specifically, Warmer, dry conditions may lead to conifers shifting to more drought tolerance mixed forests and increasing impacts from wildfire and fungal disease, Swiss needle cast, which stunts Douglas fir growth. Climate change effects could also reduce growth of moss or lichen that provide nesting substrates for marbled merlets. Climate change effects in the marine environment that affect marbled merlet prey resources are a particular concern. Climate models indicate that ocean warming is accelerating and will continue in the future, though changes in upwelling patterns that help drive marine productivity are less certain. Unusually warm weather conditions from 2013 through 16 in the Pacific Ocean known as the blob combined with a subsequent El Nino event resulted in low forage fish abundance, and many seabirds suffered starvation or breeding failures from Calif California through to Alaska during this time. Next slide. Okay, thanks, Martin. Good morning, Chair Wall, Commissioners, Director Melcher. For the record, I'm Kevin Blakely. I'm the Assistant Administrator for the Wildlife Division. Uh, I'm gonna kind of take a turn here after some of the background and highlights that Martin presented. And I'm gonna talk about the process outlined in the Oregon Endangered Species Act to demonstrate the reclassification decision framework uh, that is in, in front of you and teed up for the July commission meeting. I wanted to start out by saying that we will not be uh, deliberating in the conversations today toward any decision uh, regarding those components. Uh, that, that information really is, is not in front of you yet. As Martin uh, uh, talked about, that'll be sent out next week. 
in, in that analysis, the uh, biological assessment, it will have the current analysis across the, the, the most recent data on both population and habitat analyses, uh, uh, key components for uh, the status review as well as the uh, evaluation of the criteria. Those pieces in the most recent analyses are based on documented and verifiable scientific information and other data that includes coming from consulting with other agencies, affected cities and counties, private landowners, interested persons and organizations, and those all are incorporated in the, into the biological assessment and uh, will continue to play a role as we uh, go to the July meeting. The Muggle Murelet was listed as threatened across the federally designated distinct population segment. And that uh, segment is described earlier as Washington, Oregon and down to Central California under the federal ESA in 1992. The species was subsequently state, list, state listed as threatened in Oregon in 1995. The species is listed as state endangered in both Washington and California. The primary reason for the state and federal listings was loss and modification of older forest nesting habitat and declining population. Secondarily, a consideration uh, initially, during, during the initial listing, was bycatch and gillnet fishing operations, mainly associated in Washington state. There were also other key factors, such as Martin described with oil spills. The 2019 status review of marble mulets by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service maintained their federal ESA threatened status across the listed range that DPS described just a moment ago. The status review was initiated at the end of 2019 by the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission, and it's part of a consideration process for reclassification of the mar marble murelet from threatened to endangered. And that process, uh, uh, I guess, we'll, we can talk, you know, we'll flop back and forth between the reclassification and uplist uh, under the Oregon Endangered Species Act. In 2019, the Lane County Circuit Court issued a summary judgment of a lawsuit against the commission's decision of June 2018 to decline uplisting the marble murelet. Marble murelet. As a result, the commission in December 2019 decided to reconsider its review of the species status and determine whether circumstances meet specific legal criteria to warrant reclassification to uplist the marble murelet from threatened to endangered under the Oregon Endangered Species Act. Due to impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Lane County Circuit Court granted a stipulation motion, stipulated motion brought by both the petitioners and the commission to modify the judgment and delay the uh, timeline for the review until no later than July 31st of this year. The 2021 Marble Murelet Biological Assessment focuses on verifiable scientific information and other data relevant to the species biological and legal status in Oregon since the species was state listed as threatened in 1995 and will certainly help to inform the commission's decision. The definition of verifiable in statute is scientific information reviewed by a scientific peer review panel of outside experts who do not otherwise have a vested interest in the process. This morning, I will outline the key components relevant to each of the legal reclassification criteria, including all of the next steps uh, in the event of an uplisting decision. Marble murelet reclassification will most directly affect some state owned, some state uh, the agencies that own, manage and lease lands and the state agencies themselves. The Oregon Endangered Species Act requires affected state land owning and managing agencies to develop plans for the management and protection of endangered species on state lands. And it requires all state agencies 
to ensure that their actions on state lands are consistent with rules known as survival guidelines that we'll cover here in a bit for threatened and endangered species. Survival guidelines were not adopted for Marlboro Murillette when it was first state listed in May of 1995 because the survival guidelines requirement became effective in July 19, 1995. Advisory survival guidelines for murrelets in Oregon were adopted in 2018 by the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission. Now I'll walk through the points of decision for the legal reclassification criteria, including all those next steps in the event of an uplisting. Just as a refresher, uh, wanted to put up the definitions of threatened and endangered species uh, outlined in the Oregon Endangered Species Act. Threatened species are those likely to become endangered within the foreseeable future throughout any significant portion of their range within Oregon. This is the current status of the Marble Murillette. Endangered species are those determined to be in danger of extinction throughout any significant portion of their range within Oregon. And you can see how the current listing status as threatened logically aligns uh, the department and of course our information to the commission toward the exact task at hand. Has there now become a danger of extinction since the species was listed, state listed in 1995? By statute and reflected in administrative rule, the biological assessment is based on documented and verifiable scientific information about the species biological status. An uplisting decision to reclassify Marble Murillette from threatened to endangered requires you, the commission, to determine that since listing as a threatened species in 1995, whether the likelihood of survival of the species has diminished such that the species is in danger of extinction throughout any significant portion of its range within Oregon. Key components for this consideration that uh, uh, formulate kind of the information that you'll be seeing in the bi biological assessment and that will feed back into this primary question are since the initial listing of the murrelet in 1995, so it puts a time stamp on, on uh, kind of the task at hand, the danger of extinction and uh, that longer uh, piece of that with the uh, likelihood of survival of the species being diminished and significant portion of the murrelet range in Oregon. In evaluating the risk of extinction, the biological assessment will provide information of the life history traits outlined as Martin uh, talked about the narrow habitat requirements and restricted geographic distribution of the Marble Murillette, which make it vulnerable to a broad array of threats and stressors on the landscape. The first step in consideration for reclassifying a species is to evaluate whether the likelihood of survival of the species has diminished. In your evaluation regarding the range of the species, the commission shall consider the same biological pieces, pieces that Martin highlighted. Uh, the geographic area used by marble murrelets for all the combination of breeding, resting, or foraging, and the portion thereof in which the species is or is likely within the foreseeable future to become in danger of extinction. And that first piece really is a comparison between the whole range and if there are any significant gaps in components of that of those uh, uh, biological requirements. Also the, the uh, range of the species includes the distinctive characteristics of the habitat used by the species and habitual use of the habitats throughout that geographical area. So the first part of the decision framework focuses on whether the species meets the primary criteria for uplisting 
based on documented and verifi verifiable scientific information and other data. As I highlighted before, and, and uh, I'll just reemphasize, the key components for that consideration are since the initial listing of the murrelet, that's time stamped at 1995, the danger of extinction, and significant portion of the murrelet range in Oregon. During July's commission meeting, there will be a progressive component, component to each of these decision points that we'll go through uh, this morning. Today's workshop is a great advantage to review the, the entire breadth of the sequence uh, for each of those decision points and know where the road leads uh, with various options. Uh, I, I would say just please feel free to interrupt. I'm sure Michelle will let me know if there's a hand raised or if you have a question, uh, Chair Wall, uh, feel free to, to interrupt. I think that'll be the best way to, uh, you know, uh, to go through various what if scenarios if the commission desires as we go through these steps. Maybe the best way for uh, the commissioners and for all those listening to have a mutual understanding for the process components. Uh, through your tenure as commissioners, I would expect that you will also have occasion to uh, hear other proposals that relate directly to the Oregon Endangered Species Act and these associated administrative rules. The biological assessment will fully overview these process pieces that could be undertaken if this answer in step one here is yes, and I'll continue on with that. If the commission determines no in this initial step one regarding the diminishing likelihood of survival and danger of extinction criterion, the reclassification question has been answered and there's no further action required. If determination is yes for a vote to the danger of extinction criteria, you progress to the secondary component, component for uplisting decision requiring you to additionally determine whether at least one of these three factors exist. And I'll just summarize those as deterioration of range or uh, range or primary habitat, overutilization of the species or its habitat, or inadequate state or federal programs or regulations. Commission members will be asked to give their determination on each of the criteria if the commission has voted that the risk of extinction criteria in step one has been met. Again, the biological assessment will provide information on each of these uh, factors uh, to help uh, formulate and inform uh, your evaluation. Continuing visually with the information from step one of the decision framework, commission then has to additionally determine that at least one of those three factors shown on the previous slide exist. As noted before, a vote would be taken from each commissioner for each of the factors to determine if a majority yes or no applies to each factor, after which the final determination for step two can be made. Kevin, can I break in? It's Chair Wall, yeah, Commissioner Hyde, you bet. Okay, so I guess I just have one question here on this process. When you get to two and you get to uh, C on two, existing state or federal programs or regulations are inadequate to protect the species or its habitat. Now that, that would relate to if you go back to what you were talking about earlier, and I'm gonna bumble, bumble this up, but uh, when, the, when the commission in what time, I think you said 2019, put in advisory survival guidelines, does that relate to this? Does that relate to a, a, uh, a higher bar that was applied to the issues, would that relate to C? Okay. Chair Wall, Commissioner Hyde, I'll, I'll try to answer that, but it, again, the, the dialogue I think is, is, is excellent here. It's a great question. So uh, as we outline the existing state or federal programs or regulations, it will talk about 
uh, all kinds of things, not just federal ESA and state ESA and the advisory survival guidelines, but it'll talk about all the various programs that have occurred uh, since state listing and uh, you know, what are some you know, potential outcomes of that that will then help you inform your uh, decision on whether C is a yes or a no. Uh, so the answer is yes, the advisory survival guidelines can help inform your evaluation in the question on C, but it, it doesn't simply just start right there. And, and that basically was, uh, was something that, you know, is, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it just by itself is gonna answer that question. Does that help? Yes, that's really helpful. And I love how you guys always say good question, even if it maybe isn't good <laughs> questions. I think you guys are like trained to do that somehow. Like always say it's a good question, even, even if it's not. Um, I, I, uh, I guess the other thing that I'm wondering when we get to C is, do we, um, do we, do we get a clear understanding of what the difference would be if we uplist it in um, additional protections? I mean, like, do we get some sort of a comparison? This is what we'll do if it's uplisted versus this is what we're doing under the advisory guidelines and all the other things you're gonna talk about in C. Does that make sense? Yep, Chair okay. Wall, Commissioner Hyde. Yes, it makes absolute sense. So the process we're looking at now is just to see if we proceed with the process and the decision to uplist. Uh, whether you, uh, no matter which of the factors that is yes to and you continue on, uh, the the requirements in the ESA don't change depending on whether it is because of A, B, C, all of those or two of those. Uh, the next steps after that don't change in that fact. Um, I, I think that uh, as you answer those and have that deliberation amongst the group there, it, it can be more of an influence on a detail within the survival guidelines, but it does not change the outcome that uh, that piece is still required. Kevin, if I could just add, just for Commissioner Hatfield to hide. So the, the previous discussion uh, involved whether or not the survival guidelines would be voluntary or mandatory. And so there wasn't a lot of debate around the content of the survival guidelines. The survival guidelines were, were pretty consistent uh, regardless of, of whether they were voluntary uh, or mandatory. That makes sense. You know, I'd like to say, oh, I'm sorry. I'd like to say that that's this is making sense, but it's not making complete sense to me. Just to be honest, um, but I'm but I'm willing to just keep listening and you know. So what you're saying, Commissioner Woolley, is that those survival guidelines were put in place, but they're not mandatory and if they were if it was uplisted they would have been mandatory that's correct but i guess my question is even though those survival guidelines are not mandatory how do we know if we're doing them anyway are we doing them anyway even though they're not mandatory well, well, that's a good question. Maybe Kevin can address that because it, again, it, yep. it's, it's voluntary. And so I'm, I'm not sure if the department is actually monitoring that across you know, all agencies or not. I, I, I think not, but, but Kevin, you can help with that. Yeah, uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Woolley and Commissioner Hyde, uh, I'll, I'll cover the survival guidelines and endangered species management plans as we go through this process. And then I think I'll, I'll try to maybe make sure I'm, I'm as answering that detail of, of what Commissioner Hyde is referring to. Um, so let's make sure if it still is on your mind, we loop back to that as we get to those, uh, the, those slides. Okay, thanks. Because what, basically what I'm trying to get at is um, what, it, what would be the, the true additional protections and funding that would come in place 
if it was uplisted and is it different than where we are today? And I don't know if that's a good question or not, but it seems important to my mind, my little mind. Yep, and I'll try to answer some of those. And uh, you know, certainly the answer, uh, Commissioner Hyde, is different. It, it would be different in regards to whether the species is uplisted or not. Uh, currently in its threatened status and uh, may, maybe just some context is if, if the commission uh, lists currently any species as threatened or endangered, meaning a new listing, survival guidelines uh, become in, in place uh, you know, at that same time they're listed. They have to be prepared and adopted into rules. So it's kind of this a little bit of a difference with marble murelet because they were listed prior to when there was a requirement for uh, survival guidelines. And survival guidelines are mandatory for listed species. Kevin, I have, I have one follow-up question. Um, are we currently tracking the voluntary survival guidelines to know if they're, if they're happening and um, are we tracking any results or outcomes if we're watching them? Yeah, thank you, Chair Wall. Uh, yes, we do. We interact with uh, a number of different agencies uh, about the survival guidelines. And re remember that there are also federal ESA overlays with the species, so they already have that overlay. But, but in particular, I can highlight the Department of Forestry in looking at those advisory survival guidelines have implemented a, a number of those as part of their uh, processes on the Oregon State Forest. And uh, so, uh, yeah, we, you know, we're involved in, uh, you know, some different coordination activities uh, with both our agency leadership and at the district level. And so we, we do see some of those changes and have that dialogue uh, that have been a result of the advisory survival guidelines. Thank you. Okay, can I ask one more follow-up question on that, which is the, the, um, the, and I'm sorry, this is confusing, but you said that those hadn't come into play yet, but if, if this had been, if this bird had been listened, listed in the state as threatened without being listed as endangered, but had been listed at the right time, yeah, how would have condition. that changed? Do you know what I'm trying to ask? How would have that changed? Would have that put those survival guidelines into a more robust category of having to do them just under the threatened status? Commissioner Wall, Commissioner Hyde, uh, well, it's a great question. In fact, I'm, I'm flashing back to uh, previous Commissioner Weber who was in the same place for asking questions. And it really is a, currently if any uh, species is listed as threatened or endangered, survival guidelines are put into play and they are mandatory. When the marble murelet was listed, that, uh, that amendment to the Oregon's uh, Endangered Species Act did not include the survival guideline for any species that's listed. That change occurred just months after, after that listing, uh, you know, after that, that year's legislative session. And uh, so it, it put into this kind of odd place that marble murelets were listed or listed as threatened, but at the time they were listing listed, there was not a requirement for mandatory survival guidelines. Okay, so then I have another question based on that. Is there any way for us to relist them as threatened instead of uplisting them? That's kind of a legal question and probably, but. Yeah. Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Hyde, I, I, I don't recall whether that was part of the conversation we had before um, in, in regards to, you know, uh, delisting them and then bringing them back. And then it makes that, that uh, overlay mandatory at that point. I, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, Right, I don't have an accurate answer for that. If Erin uh, thinks she has one, then uh, we, we could certainly talk about that. 
And I just made a note of that question to, um, to be able to give it some thought and advise you on it later on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so with the slide that's on the screen there, uh, you know, we were talking about just the processes from step one, getting to step two with the three factors, and then where you go from there. Um, so what I want to do is just continue on with the yes, uh, that would be uh, from step one, and then a, a yes in at least one of the factors in step two, and uh, continue from there. Because as, as you get to that point, it still is that the species qualifies for reclassification as state endangered. Uh, the uplist, uplisting determination process isn't complete yet and uh, need to talk about a couple other steps that's required under the Oregon Endangered Species Act. So under certain circumstances, the commission may decide not to uplist a species that would other qualif otherwise qualify as endangered. This optional path where determination to not uplist may be made even after progressing through steps one and two considers if the future of the species is secure outside Oregon or if the species is not of cultural, scientific or commercial significance or if the species has been listed under the federal ESA. It's important to note that uh, before making this optional determination not to list as state endangered because the species in this case is already federally listed as threatened, the commission uh, shall evaluate whether the federal listing adequately protects the species in Oregon. Even with that evaluation, uh, that, that does not limit the commission's authority on whether or not to uplist. What I want to say about this, um, this optional pathway is this is a uh, part of the Endangered Species Act that uh, is most often and discussed in play with initial listing of a species. And uh, uh, it just need to make sure that the commission is aware of this optional path and uh, that we uh, you know, undertake that discussion. The commission should determine whether they want to officially take this option to not list a species that would otherwise qualify for listing and will be asked to identify which circumstances are considered applicable. Kevin, a quick question before you leave that slide. Is there anything in your material that you're sending next week? Does anything in your material speak to this one, especially about A? Chair Wall, uh, yes, uh, the, the materials do cover uh, this uh, optional uh, pathway. And uh, earlier in the, you know, within that section, we cover A, B, and C, but also uh, within the document itself, it, it talks about that, particularly through the listing, you know, status that I covered earlier uh, outside the state and throughout the uh, DPS. Thank you. The first part of our process discussion for the decision framework focused on whether the species meets criteria for uplisting. That's the blue pathway. The optional analysis path in red as step three addresses those circumstances for which the commission may choose not to uplist a species that otherwise qualifies to be listed. So the, the the best opportunity to kind of overview the, the framework itself is, is this slide here. And uh, uh, I'm gonna continue on uh, with some other steps uh, that would happen if the commission decides to uplist, then what, what are some other process steps from there? Going uh, as it's reclassified from threatened status to endangered. Before you leave that, Kevin, um, I have a question. Has anybody, uh, has any species fallen under B in that option? Chair Wall, Commissioner Zarnowitz, are you referring to 2B? Yeah, no, 3B, this red 
the red block, the red box. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Zarnowitz, uh, I don't recall that, uh, you know, we, we've, uh, you know, undertaken for just that specific reason, in any of that optional path that was, and that was the, the, the primary reason. Uh, my tenure though, certainly isn't going to be able to reach back enough to, uh, you know, to know if it's ever been done, but I, I don't recollect that we've had a conversation where that has been a primary uh, reason that you would do that optional path. Thank you. Kevin, have, do you, does your um, tenure go back far enough to tell us if we have, if a commission has used this one? Has the state not listed one that they would otherwise list based on these three options? Yeah, and I probably would look to Martin as the threatened and endangered sensitive species coordinator. Uh, you know, I, he could just drop something in a chat box for me if he'd like, or uh, come back on screen and answer the question. But I, I do not have that recollection. Thank you. Yeah, well, th this is Martin Newton. Um, I think uh, I would just add that the, uh, the existing state list of threatened and endangered species is made up of uh, a number of factors. Um, firstly, it was uh, those species that were originally conceived as threatened or endangered by the Fish and Wildlife Commission before the state enactment in 1985. It also had to include species that were federally listed um, as of May 1985, and those species that have been added since by the Commission. And um, the, none of those um, have there have been species that have worked through the, uh, the criteria that Kevin's just outlined, um, but uh, they, were, they were taken as a package of factors rather than single items. But so the, the, the list is made up of all of those um, routes to get the species listed, as it were. Thank you. I hope that helps. Mm -hmm. It does. Thanks, Martin. And Kevin? Commissioner Labhart has his hand up. Yeah, th I guess this is a question for Aaron. Um, Aaron, is there a legal definition for cultural, scientific, or commercial significance? Because I can see where that could be an issue. What, what is uh, the definition of cultural? What is the definition of scientific? What's the definition of commercial significance? Is there a legal definition for that? There are not legal definitions for cultural that no there are no legal definitions i'm looking in the administrative rules that implement the endangered species act and there are no um legal definitions for those terms and so we would look to webster's dictionary for the most appropriate definitions in this context okay thank you <laughs> Yeah, and Chair Wall, Commissioner Laphart, that's what we did. And as part of the, you know, the, the criteria view along with the biological assessment, that's what we do is give you the information that we think was applicable to that direct question using just those uh, common definitions. Okay, so I'm gonna proceed with and, and highlight with what comes next. A couple of items to keep in mind as we progress through implementing a potential uplisting decision for the Marble Murelet. The Oregon Endangered Species Act does not by itself require an owner of any commercial forest land or other private land to take action to protect a threatened or endangered species or impose requirements or restrictions on the use of private land. As mentioned that uh, before, there are overlays of through both the Endangered Species Act of Oregon and federal laws for the direct take of any murelet, which is prohibited anywhere on the landscape. As well, and specifically through statute, the commission is required to work with private landowners, affected cities, counties, and local service districts, which is defined in statute, to mitigate the adverse impact on local economies when the commission 
adds a threatened or endangered species to the state list. And uh, that, that part of the statute certainly is part of the conversation as uh, staff works with those same entities to develop what survival guidelines overlays are onto state agencies. Kevin, before you leave that one, a quick question. We have done that in the past several times, correct? We have worked with these groups to figure out how to mitigate the impacts when, when species are added. Chair Wall, yes, that's a part of the process. Even as we under, undertook a, uh, our biological assessment and uh, we, we reach out, you know, required to reach out to those same entities and it does include tribes on our outreach to see uh, if they have information, data, and we also then get feedback about you know, impacts and that. I, and uh, through the commission process in 2018, uh, there was lots of interaction, uh, comments and testimony submitted uh, that, that were informative on this uh, statute requirement. I, I, this is Becky again, I have a, a follow-up question too, which is, how um, does the federal threatened status, and I know that um, you guys probably shouldn't have to be the experts on federal ESA as well as state, but do, does, the, does the federal threatened status have an effect on private land? Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Hyde, it certainly does. The Federal Endangered Species Act applies across the entire landscape in Oregon, regardless of land ownership. And, and maybe I, I can give an example. Uh, uh, Commissioner Woolley will remember when we had addressed and drafted the uh, what would have been mandatory survival guidelines, we had a lot of conversation uh, with Oregon Department of Forestry and affected counties on any kind of survival guidelines that would impact um, timber volume on uh, sold sales that were already, already sold sales and uh, what that impact would be moving forward over the next you know, several years from the adoption of mandatory survival guidelines. And all that conversation really was with the, uh, a, a lot to do with uh, mitigating any impacts that would have come on to to any of the state forest lands with part of the processes they already had in play for timber sales. So uh, lots of conversation and development of that. So that kind of gives you an example how, you know, and, and it says the commission, but you know, it, it really is the department working and doing all that. But I guess, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, do we have a sense of what the federal protections are that are in place if they are covering the, the, the whole of lands. So they would be covering not just private lands, but also state lands, right? Like, do we have a clear understanding of what is being, has been put in place based on the federal threatened status? Yep, Chair sure. Wall, Commissioner Hyde. And, yeah. maybe, and maybe you answered that. Maybe you just answered that, but it didn't filter through to my. Chair Wall, Commissioner Hyde, that's perfectly fine. Um, it, uh, it, it does overlay. And we know that as uh, say on private lands, as forest sales are undertaken there or timber sales, they are required uh, to make sure they aren't taking uh, marble murelets. And uh, so the uh, overlays that often occur and are in play for uh, that Oregon Department of Forestry undertakes uh, where they do uh, surveys uh, uh, before sales are sold. Uh, they don't have that direct overlay, but they still have the overlay that they cannot take uh, murelets as part of their harvest activities. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Kevin, I do have one other question on this. As I heard you describe this framework, which has been very helpful the way you're stepping through this, you said next steps and, and you're talking about the next steps if we were to come to a yes. 
And so this, this one is part of the how things would be implemented if there is a yes. Is that the correct way to look at the framework? Do you yeah, want to uh, uh, Chair Wall, uh, the, the answer to that is yes. Um, you know, the, and this is when it adds a species to the list of threatened and endangered. So truly even as a threatened species now, uh, you know, some of that is, is undertaken already, but uh, you know, when, when you reclassify, you are you know, changing the status of that species. So you need to make sure, and, and I'm just trying to highlight every little piece that's in play as you go through that process. So it, it, it does, you know, we have to keep this in mind as we reclassify, but as uh, described before, uh, a lot of this overlay or components of this over overlay already exist because they are threatened and have that uh, uh, overlay. Thank you. Okay, so simultaneously with reclassifying the marble muralet, there would be proposed survival guidelines in front of you which are required through the Oregon Endangered Species Act. Survival guidelines are in, intended to minimize potential for unauthorized take, or more simply, take avoidance of marble murelets on state lands. These survival guidelines do not apply to private lands or other non-state public lands. The federal listing status of the marble murelet as threatened already requires a level of protection and regulations under the federal ESA apply to all land ownerships. Uh, so that's uh, federal, state, and other forest lands. The current advisory survival guidelines and any proposed amendments which would be considered if uplisting is desired, use the federal definition of take, which is broader than the state definition and addresses harm due to significant habitat modification or degradation, as well as harassment due to disturbance that disrupts normal behavior patterns related to breeding, feeding, or sheltering by an individual member of the species. Each of the bullets on the slide here uh, are addressed in various sections of the survival guidelines through the administrative rules that are currently in place and those that would be amended if they are mandatory with uplisting. The Oregon Endangered Species Act distinguishes between state landowning and non-landowning agency responsibilities. And again, that we're gonna start dwelling into the state agency uh, aspect of this because the overlay uh, at this point is just two state agencies on state lands. I'll first address requirements for state agencies that uh, own, manage, or lease lands. In the endangered species planning process, the commission determines if state land can play a role in the conservation of the species. That is whether state agencies that own or manage lands with suitable habitat for the species, for the listed species, uh, could have a role. For murelets, forested habitats are essential and there are certainly a few key state agencies that would certainly have a role in conservation of the species. Under the Oregon Endangered Species Act, landowning agencies have some discretion in, in determining their role and how they would uh, uh, you know, move forward with conservation of the marble murelet. Their role may include, but is not limited to just conservation. And conservation is defined in the Oregon Endangered Species Act as the means, methods, and procedures to bring the species to the point where measures provided in the Endangered Species Act of Oregon are no longer necessary. The department provides information on conservation needs of the species. And much of that scientific and technical information is included or will be included in the biological assessment. And it identifies key factors influencing the species survival and breeding needs. Oregon's Endangered Species Act requires these state agencies to develop endangered species management plans. In developing management plans, 
Those state agencies are balancing statutes, rules, policy, social economic impacts, and conservation needs of the species, and then are required to seek approval from the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission within 18 months from uplisting uh, that the state agency is accomplishing uh, their identified role in conserving marble murelets. So Kevin, just a quick question. So with the information I'm getting next week, will that include a breakdown of a suitable habitat within state owned lands? Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Woolley, uh, the biological assessment uh, will include the most recent analyses of forested lands uh, in Oregon. And that analysis I, analysis, I believe, does break down to state lands as well. Okay, and, and it specifies suitable habitat that, that fits the, ha the habitat criteria for age class and that sort of thing that's needed for the murelet. Is, is that true? Chair Wall, Commissioner Woolley, uh, it depends on what detail level you're looking at. Um, I will say that the Northwest Forest Plan, that analysis uh, uses different terminology and different breakdowns than suitable habitat. Uh, and, and so you'll see some of that in that analysis. Okay, yeah, I'm just and, uh, it, Rather than suitable habitat, the, the term that the, the analysis uses is a uh, high probability nesting habitat. So it tried to, tries to get a little bit more definitive and, and I think it does a, a good job in outlining, uh, you know, that category as well as changes. Okay, yeah, I was just thinking of, of Martin's uh, criteria that he described with, you know, roughly, 80 year old trees and, and greater. Chair Wall, Woolley, Chair, uh, Commissioner Woolley. Yep, I, I agree. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Okay, continuing on with endangered species management plans for state owned managed and leased lands once the commission approves the state agency's endangered species management plan, uh, they, they will in turn, that endangered species management plan supersedes the survival guidelines because they, they would have incorporated the components of those guidelines in the way that that agency uh, you know, can play their uh, defined role. Endangered species management plans are intended to provide long-term management opportunities for conservation of the species. Also remember that the marble murelet is already protected everywhere on the landscape as a threatened species under a federal ESA. And this is uh, particularly evident across our state lands in this case that we're comparing them to and already has protection levels that are administered and through consultation with US Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, state agency endangered species management plan need to bear in mind all the federal uh, regulatory overlays uh, as all those federal, federal protections would still apply as uh, they move forward with their endangered species management plan by those state agency, agencies. For non-landowning managing state agencies, the commission determines whether such agencies can also play a role in conservation of the species. If so, the agencies are formally notified of this. Unlike the landowning agencies that I just covered, there is no statutory or rule timeframe for this determination. And uh, again, all, all agencies still have to look toward the survival guidelines as a framework to uh, you know, um, uh, move forward with conservation for model murelets. When notified, those non-landowning state agencies are required to col consult with the department to ensure that their actions are consistent with the commission's survival guidelines. 
before you leave that one, Kevin, could you, could you go back to what you said about the, for these non-landowning agencies, you said there was no timeline on which action or which step? Chair Wall, uh, that would refer to uh, endangered species management plans. So in, in this scenario, or what I think it is trying to make sure of is that there is not a ticking clock where uh, a, a state agency that is non-landowning currently, if they had some change in their activity, role on the landscape, anything like that, and they now, in our viewpoint, have a, a lot different role to play uh, that then they, they could still come into the queue and, and have some of those requirements. As well as sometimes there are state agencies that um, even though they are non-landowning, they still can play a role uh, for conservation of the species. And uh, as Martin highlighted some of the other stressors and, and factors affecting murelet populations, you can think about activities in the marine environment or activities in the terrestrial uh, realm, you know, near, near shore coast terrestrial uh, that, you know, could be undertaken by state agencies as activities or, or interactions that, uh, that they just need to make sure of and we'd be aware of those and you know, we could notify them and, and uh, consult with them about that activity and, and how it potentially uh, just, I don't know if needs to be changed is the right word, but we consult with them about what, that, what their role is and make sure that they're consistent with the survival guidelines. Uh, and I'm, I apologize, I don't have a, a you know, really concrete example to give you. That's okay, I just wanna make sure I understand this one and it's, they, for these agencies, it's a consultation because we need to figure out what the role might be that would be important in this one, but there are no timelines if, if we think it would be important that they do a management plan and are there also no guide no timelines if we think it's important that they do survival guidelines or that they that they comply with survival guidelines yeah uh chair wall that that is correct the most important piece there is uh you know they they may not even or or wouldn't be as familiar maybe we don't interact with them on a different uh, coordination and meetings and different things. They may not even be aware of the survival guidelines. So that's our opportunity to interact with them at a, okay. at a consulting agency to agency basis, uh, get them familiar with the survival guidelines and work through them how, how they uh, you know, uh, could, could play that role in the conservation of the species. Okay, and it looks like Commissioner Labhart has his hand up for a question. Well, maybe another question for Aaron or maybe Kevin. Um, sorry, but do universities, do they, uh, did the ESA apply to them, Oregon State University, university owned property? Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Labhart, um, you're referring to a university lands? Um, well, yeah, university owned property. For example, Oregon State's probably going to, I, I, I'm not up to speed totally on it, but the Elliott State Forest, uh, I think OSU is going to acquire that. Does, does that apply? Well, they would be a landowning agency. Well, are they an agency? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Labhart, I probably will phone a friend here and uh, <laughs> see if Aaron has some opportunity to for us either to uh, get the uh, exact answer for that or... or uh, give some uh, input. I will, I will do that research. I know that um, in the past six years or so, the status of state universities in terms of whether they're an agency and so represented by DOJ and subject to contracting requirements and that kind of thing has changed. Um, that's not been something that I've been focused on. It's just something that's in the back of my mind. And so there are some relatively recent developments that I will sort out and then be able to let you know on that. Okay. Yep. At least before July. Yeah. Before yes. our meeting in July. Yeah. Thank you. Great. 
Let me do a, just a really quick check, Kevin. Um, Commissioners Spellbrink and Khalil, I, I, we, if you have questions, I just wanna check that you're not missing an opportunity if you wanted to ask a question. Good, I am, uh, any question I have had has been already asked more eloquently by one of the other commissioners, so. But thank <laughs> you for checking. And yeah, any questions here, any man more have been answered, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, just wanted to check. Um, thank, uh, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, Chair Wall, that actually, yeah, that actually would be the, the point where I was looking to, uh, you know, just get back with you and the commissioners to see if there are any additional questions. Martin and I would be happy to answer those, go back to any slide. Uh, I think one beneficial thing here, I, I hope the, the outline of the framework, you know, by being in that PowerPoint slide, it, you know, with everybody seeing that uh, good transparency certainly is a good, good way to ask uh, an additional question if one comes, comes to the mind within the next week or so uh, as you get the materials next week and uh, start that in individual commissioner uh, dive into that. Not much of a break between tomorrow's commission meeting and what's up next, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's fun. Okay. So, so Kevin, I just have a clarifying question. If you could just go back to, I think it's just the previous slide about the roles of other agencies. Um, so you're talking about this in a general sense, right? as opposed to what other, other agencies that own state lands uh, would need to comply with uh, in terms of survival guidelines. I mean, what I'm recalling is that if, you know, our commission adapts uh, or uplists and then requires mandatory survival guidelines, then all other agencies, public, state agencies that own state lands would need to be in compliance with that. And so when you talk about just the role here, you're not referring to that, to those requirements, are you? You're just talking about in general, working with other, you know, private entities and, you know, other entities in, in a more general sense about their role in conservation. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, Chair Wall, Commissioner Woolley, uh, yeah, yes, that is correct. So uh, we would directly um, notify uh, and, you know, some very specific state agencies that, you know, uh, previously and, and currently working with them, they are landowning agencies that uh, in this letter, you know, coming from the department, we would identify that they, they can and uh, will be playing a role in the conservation of the species. For those agencies that we notify, they then have that 18 month time period uh, to submit that and, and get an endangered species plan uh, uh, completed. For the non-landowning agencies, the survival guidelines still apply, but their role has a little bit more of a, you know, they don't get officially notified. They aren't under a, uh, uh, you know, a task to complete an endangered species management plan but the survival guidelines affect all state agencies. It's just that currently for the non-landowning agencies, the role is really that it's in more this longer term or a changing thing. It doesn't have a time frame, but they, they still have to, um, you know, or, or they still would fall under the purview of the survival guidelines if they have actions uh, that either the agency or, or e even individuals think that uh, uh, are affecting the conservation of the species. Okay, thanks Kevin. A follow up there, if there is no timeline, are those essentially voluntary guidelines then or are they mandatory guidelines? If the marble mirrorlet is uplisted, the uh, survival guidelines become mandatory and they apply to state agencies on state lands. Hmm. Yeah, and, and just another finer point that I, I remember posing a few years ago, I asked, well, could, could there be mandatory survival guidelines imposed under the threatened status? And the answer was no. 
uh, in order for guidelines uh, to be mandatory, it does require an uplisting to endangered status. But isn't that follow up on the question that I was asking Aaron, which is because these were listed as threatened before the mandatory guidelines went in play for threatened, if we were able to somehow relist as threatened, then those mandatory guidelines would come into play? That it's sort of an accident that these mandatory, is, am I making sense there, Kevin? Yeah, Ch uh, Chair Wall, Commissioners Woolley and Hyde, that, that's exactly the scenario that, that we'll give you some additional information on. Uh, that was a pathway that, like I said, I, I cannot recall that we deliberated on that uh, as Commissioner Woolley stating, that's where we ended up that you could not currently under its threatened status uh, make the survival guidelines mandatory, but uh, Commissioner Hyde outlined a scenario that we did not have an answer to and we'll provide that. Which, you know what I'm saying, Commissioner Woolley, is that if, I mean, I don't know how you could do this, but if we actually relisted it as threatened now, then those survival guidelines would could potentially come into play without having to uplist it to endangered. So when you say relist- if it's threatened, if it is, because it should have, I mean, I guess this is the question, Kevin, is if, we, if it, it really would have been mandatory it under threatened if we had had we could have done that right yeah uh, chair wall commissioner hyde if it had been listed in august of 1995 it would have had the mandatory survival guideline overlay i, I would point out you know and it, it is likely not just a simple yes no answer because you know, removing a species from the list also has a very specific pass in the Endangered Species Act. So it, it uh, you, uh, that, that's the piece that uh, Aaron and I will undertake to try to make that a simple answer as possible. Uh, but removing- No, we couldn't, we couldn't just, we would have to delist it to relist it, or we don't know what we'd have to do. Yeah, Chair Wall, Commissioner Hyde, I don't know if I could put the listing in time out and bring it back. <laughs> so we'll, we'll figure that out. I mean, this seems really, frankly, it seems really dumb, right? Like it should, the man, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't seem like we should have to list it as endangered to create a mandatory requirement that would have been there if just under the threatened list, listing. Like we're, it just doesn't, it doesn't make any common sense to me. Like it's just wrong. I think um, Chair Wall, if I could say a few things. Go right ahead, Director. So I think it's really important that you, you know, recognize that this is very analogous to many other things that we do. And the, the under, you know, we are, we are implementing Oregon statute here that the legislature drafted they amended it in 1995 to include this piece about mandatory survival guidelines. But the trigger, the trigger in this case for adopting mandatory uh, survival guidelines is at the time of a commission action. So any prior listing was, uh, for lack of a better, better term, grandfathered into the old um, statutory requirements. And so what we have here is um, we're, of course, you received the petition to uplist. We've been, we've been through all that history. Um, it, the, the man, we actually went down, we had this very similar discussion. We could dredge up the old commission archives from uh, several meetings in 2018, uh, several discussions on a similar approach and and um, the reality is we, we have a petition to uplist and that is the commission's task. And if you decide to uplist, then the statute will require that you adopt mandatory survival guidelines. And I know it's been mentioned, but I just wanna put a finer point on the mandatory survival guidelines are really, they're an interim measure. 
though they don't last forever, they're an interim measure that essentially is put in place for the 18 month period while the state landowning agencies develop their own endangered species management plans. So um, uh, anyway, I, I just, I wanted to say those few things and just wanna make sure we don't lose sight of the fact that we do have, we're reacting to a petition to uplist and yeah, it'd be nice to go back, turn the clock back to 1995, but that's, really not our task before us here. Okay, and Director Melcher, just, I know we're kind of getting ahead of the game here, but you mentioned uh, after the 18 month period uh, that the individual agencies need to establish their own uh, management plan. And so what role does our department have with uh, the process of other agencies developing their management plans and, and are, are there department standards of ours that apply, um, that, that help to guide those agencies. Yeah, thanks to Chair Walk, Commissioner Woolley. Uh, certainly we will be engaged with them uh, as they develop their, their endangered species management plans. And I think of course, as Kevin mentioned, they have some other statutory um, sideboards, if you will, that they will work within. And, but ultimately their endangered species management plans come back to the commission for approval. So the Department of Forestry, Board of Forestry, for instance, just as one example, if the decision is to uplist, then within 18 months, they will be back with the endangered species management plan for the commission to approve. Okay, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I remember that and maybe Kevin was going to get to that or maybe Aaron was, but I just wanted to make sure that came up. Thank you. Commissioner Labhart, you had a question as well or did it get answered? Well, I think it just got answered. <laughs> I was going to ask Kevin or I think Rod Kramer because I really didn't know. I was wondering if ODF had an endangered species management plan and if they do, does it include murelets? And I think the answer that I just heard Kurt say was no. They would have to develop one until uh, there was an uplisting. Is that, am I interpreting that correctly? Chair Wall, uh, Commissioner Labhart, that, that's correct. They, they have undertaken consultation though. They have a take permit, a US Fish and Wildlife Service incidental take permit uh, as, uh, that's uh, consulted for the activities they do on their state forest land. So there is uh, you know, certainly that kind of planning, uh, review, and documentation of their activities as they manage those lands uh, for both uh, federally and state listed species and for production of, of timber. Okay, so that leads me to another question, and I think Doug has been involved in this, but uh, the Board of Forestry directed ODF to do an HCP, and so the board has begun that process to develop an HCP. Does it include murelets? Chair Wall, Commissioner Labhart, uh, yes, it does in those habitats. And uh, the, the way that HCPs would be viewed in the Endangered Species Management Plan process is that if the Oregon Department of Forestry has reviewed and completed HCP through the appropriate consulting agencies, that's an in incidental take permit in and of itself. And that satisfies the requirement for an Endangered Species Management Plan by statute. Okay, thank you. So the just to clarify, the trigger in that case would, or the, the, the bar in that case would be if it's already gone through the process and is in place, is that right, Kevin? If the HCP is already in place, it would satisfy the management plan requirement? Chair Wall, that, that is correct. Okay, and so then that I is- have a question. Not Oh, sorry, uh, Commissioner Zarnowitz, go ahead. Zarnowitz. <laughs> um, I, my hand raise function for some reason is gone after an update. So I <laughs> couldn't raise my hand uh, mechanic or I had to do it like this. Anyway, um, the question I have kind of goes off to a, a different point. So I don't know if uh, Commissioner Woolley was still following up on this last one or not. Well, I was, so if I could just do the quick follow up. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so with this HCP, which ODF is developing, would that then, that, that would automatically 
meet requirements and then not be subject to review and approval by our commission as, as adequate and, and sufficient a level of protection. Um, is, is that correct, Kevin? Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Woolley, I, I think when we go back uh, and look, the, we, we'd still have to get that document in front of us, you know, in, in front of the commission. Uh, but that, uh, I think the statute says that if they're an incidental take permit for that species uh, does satisfy the requirement. So uh, I, I think just agency to agency, we would get the information back, but I think it would not be as a, an approval process for that because of that language in the statute. Okay, so then we would essentially be just trusting their, their sort of self-regulation in, in that sense. Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Woolley, and, and so the uh, the consultation that they would undertake in doing that, it, it would satisfy uh, probably beyond what we have in those mandatory survival guidelines. Okay. And, it, and it would outline each of those categories as well, whether it's threats and stressors from disturbance and, you know, uh, the uh, predator type issues and attractants uh, as part of their operational and recreational uses, as well as uh, forestry operations. So you're also talking about a, a legal consultation, such as a Section 7 consultation with Fish and Wildlife. Would, would that be included? Chair Wall, Commissioner Woolley, it, exactly. That's part of the HCP process, is that Section 7 entire process. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for clarifying that, Kevin. Commissioner Zarnowitz, can I follow up, just because I'm still on this point? Thank okay. you. And I have the same problem as you. My hand raise isn't working. So, um, so here's what I don't understand. They are working on an HCP on forest, on state forest lands, even, um, even though the marbled merlet is just threatened. So you can create it at HCP for a threat, a federally threatened species. Yeah, Chair Wall, Commissioner Hyde, the uh, habitat conservation planning process, it gives you long-term assurances for actions that you're undertaking on, on those lands. Uh, habitat conservation planning processes, you know, they can be undertaken by, uh, in individuals, you know, uh, you know, ownerships, corporate ownerships, uh, state ownerships. It, it's not just some, not just a tool uh, that is uh, available to just state to federal consultation and use. Well, I guess I I knew that uh, I I know what habitat conservation plans are. I'm familiar with that, but I didn't know that they go in place for threatened species. I thought that they just went in place for endangered. So basically what you are saying, and I guess I don't understand the timeline on the, the, the HCP process on our federal, or on our state lands right now, where we are in that process and when that comes up. But my, you know, my understanding of HCP is that it's pretty, I mean, you have to meet a, a really high bar, like you were saying. Um, yep. And uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Hyde, apologize. I didn't really go into more depth on the on, uh, on the HCPs, they, they cover a, a broad array of species and habitats. So um, what I could do is if you'd like, I know I have Rod Kramer in the room and he is participating on the HCP planning process uh, through that. And he could probably give you a, a just a really good brief background on, on that process. And it, it does overlay much more than just the marble murelet. And when that will conclude that yeah. I think that'd be really, I think that's really important because it feels like we're trying to put in place the same things that we're already, that we would then be trying to put in place. Right. Like. <laughs> Chair Wall, Commissioner Hyde. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Michelle, if you could uh, bring Rod into the room and uh, he'll have him introduce himself for the record, he can uh, give some background and a answer some more, some more questions. Um, yeah, this is Rod. I'm I'm up. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Thanks, Rod. If if you could introduce yourself for the record and uh, uh, 
help us through some of the HCP questions. That'd be perfect. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kevin. Yes, Chair Wall, Commissioners, and uh, Director Melcher, uh, my name is Rod Kramer. I'm the Forest Program Coordinator with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And, uh, and Rod, if you could give uh, just an overview of the HCP you're working on with Department of Forestry in an idea of the timeline, expectations in the timeline. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, yes, yes. Um, where do I begin with that process? It's been an ongoing process for several years. Um, the Department of Forestry has embarked, well, let me back up a, a little bit. I mean, you know, the Department of Forestry, there, there's a couple ways to really um, comply with the Federal Endangered Species Act. Um, one option for doing that is take avoidance. That's largely what the Department of Forestry is doing now. Um, step two or another option to get compliance under the federal ESA would be to develop a habitat conservation plan. And so that process has been, on, been ongoing now for a couple of years. Um, a very intense process, very quick timeline. Board of Forestry um, has approved that, that process. We're, we're kind of in the middle right now. Um, in what's called the NEPA process. We've developed, or the Department of Forestry in collaboration with the federal agencies and state agencies have developed a draft habitat conservation plan right now. And that is going through the, the federal public NEPA or National Environmental Policy Act process right now. That's gonna um, happen for another year about. So that will also entail the federal services uh, compiling a, a federal endangered, or not endangered, I'm sorry, uh, an, uh, an environmental impact statement. And so that will be the basis on how the federal agencies will either approve um, the uh, incidental take permit that's in, embodied within the HCP itself. Uh, the timeline is really to have that completed um, next year, 2022, and that would go before the Board of Forestry um, in late 2022, and the anticipated timeline is to hopefully get Board of Forestry approval on that, on that ACP for implementation in early 2023. Okay, so Thank, thank you for that, Rod. I, I'm a little confused. You, you mentioned at one point you said it was a quick process and then now it sounds like a, about a four year process. But um, so going through NEPA, normally there's a record of decision. I mean, there are alternatives and then um, there is an alternative that's selected. I mean, is that also part of the, this process? Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner, Willie and Director Melcher, yes. Um, I mean, it, it is a lengthy process. So um, it, I was mistaken if I said it was a quick process. It is a very lengthy process that takes several years. Um, and we're, like I said, probably two years into a four year process. Um, but yes, um, the environmental impact statement process in the NEPA, within the NEPA process would have alternatives developed under it that would be analyzed alongside the draft HCP. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, and then, and then when is that public involvement period scheduled? Is that for next year? Yeah, that is ongoing. Um, I would need to double check on the exact dates for when public comment will be received. Um, but yes, that is anticipated to occur now through next year. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I guess part of the question is, should that, I mean, that's a, as you say, an ongoing lengthy process. Should the fact that that process is occurring, I guess we have to determine, to, would that have any influence on, on our decision making? Uh, because I know often, I mean, what I've seen in the past is that, you know, ODF has had processes uh, occurring over time, uh, studies and so on. And, and we've often been asked to wait for the outcome of those before we make a decision. And so sometimes it feels sort of like kicking the can down the road. And, and so I guess part of, part of our decision-making is to, should we be taking this HCP in consideration 
and that that would mean some sort of assumptions of what the outcome will be, which we don't know. Um, anyway, I'm just kind of thinking out loud about this as as we go along. So Other, that's, yeah, just more. That, that's more of a comment. Oh, uh, Commissioner Zarnowitz has her hand up. Were you were you actually finished though, Commissioner yeah. Wally? Yeah, I'm 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 finished for now. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Zarnowitz. <Yeah. laughs> Um, yeah, in the very beginning, um, Kevin, you mentioned um, that the data, verifiable data um, needed to be reviewed by outside scientists. And at which step is that done again? Yeah, Chair Wall, Commissioner Zarnowitz, uh, I, I kept referring back to that because that helps us uh, kind of make sure that the, uh, the material and information analyses that we put into the biological assessment meets those criteria. Uh, that, that overlay, uh, you know, when it comes to the biological assessment, doesn't necessarily it mean it's required for us to get external review of that same data in our analysis. It really is to make sure that the data we're compiling in the analysis is there if we were bringing in our own data for that, we would need to make sure it fits those same criteria as well for those uh, you know, peer reviewed journals, that sort of, of information included. So has, has that been done in this case related to this petition? Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Zarnowitz, uh, Maybe help me understand when you're talking about the information in the biological assessment is coming from analyses and information of, of that sort, verifiable scientific information from published journals or from agency experts that has undergone their internal uh, expert review. Okay, and so that will be listed, all that information will be listed in in the uh, biological analysis. Chair Wall, Commissioner Zarnowitz, yes, the biological assessment and the, the review of the criteria include a very lengthy literature cited section. Okay, and is that something we're gonna get before July? Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Zarnowitz, that entire package is coming next week. Okay, great, thank you. I'd like to, um, Commissioner Labhart, I see that your hand is up and I'll come right back to you, but could I just um, clarify the answer to that one, Kevin? You, did you say that the data used in our biological assessment will be peer reviewed, but our conclusions and our conclusions will not, those are internally reviewed? Did sure, you well, yeah, yeah. yes, that, that is correct, yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Labhart. Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of surprised that Aaron didn't jump in um, on this question. Um, I'm back to the HCP. So, and it's kind of, for me, it's kind of like a chicken and egg thing. Um, it sounds like uh, the HCP, which four years is, in what I've heard is rocket speed for an HCP. So, um, but anyway, we're a couple of years into it. It's now being reviewed by NOAA and, or NOAA, yeah, yeah, yeah NOAA. And so it's going through that process right now. And it does include murelets as well as other species. So I was thinking, well, what, what do we, I was kind of going on the same notion as Commissioner Woolley. Well, what are we doing working on this? If it's going to have greater protections with an ACP and it sounds like it's going to move ahead and I think the department has pretty given clear direction that they want this HCP now, but the legal, we, we are under a court order to rule by the end of July. So it seems to me that we have to make a decision irrespective of the HCP by the end of July on whether to uplist or not. So Aaron, is that a correct assumption? Yes, you need to make your decision on the petition, which is asking the commission to decide whether to uplist by the end of July. Okay, so irrespective of whether the HCP is gonna be better or not, we still have to uh, weigh in 
on the end of July, unless we get an extension from the court or not. So that's what okay. I'm hearing you say. Yes, you have a July deadline. Okay, yeah. that clarifies it for me. Thank you. Thank you, and Commissioner Hatfield Hyde. Okay, so the other, I, I guess, uh, sorry, the other question that I had is, so this came to us by petition and I'm not sure when it initially came by petition. Um, and then, you know, we had all the, 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 the stuff that happened around it um, with the previous commission. But I guess my question is, if you, uh, if you are a threatened species in Oregon under the Oregon Endangered Species Act, what is the process to do like a process check on how well you are doing on whatever it is you're supposed to be doing based on the fact that it's threatened? And like, were we doing that? Yeah, sure. Well, Commissioner Hyde, that, that's a great question because it uh, in the, early in the slideshow, I talked about, you know, just giving the definitions of threatened and endangered species. And uh, the, the statute and rule do require us to, you know, uh, take a look at uh, our list of the threatened and endangered species at least every five years. And so sometimes that look is a, a very... Uh, light look of, of current science and undertaking. And sometimes that look is much more thorough in regards to a, a complete biological assessment. And uh, so the, the processes that we're in, we're in right now, uh, in some cases, uh, you know, we, we undertake those ourselves uh, because we see that situations have changed for the species on the landscape. And that could be either for better or for worse. Uh, so uh, that, that question of, when we look at those is certainly a component of the statute and rule. Uh, so so where, where were we in, in the process of that review happening anyway? And I, I'm, I'm sensitive like to Kurt, you know, when my question was like, gee, why are we uplisting something that doesn't even, we haven't even been able to put the correct measures in as a threatened species, why would we? And Kurt was kind of like, it doesn't matter, Becky. <laughs> it's what we have to do. So this may be another question that doesn't matter, but where would have we been in the five-year review of this had the petitioners not brought it? Yeah, um, so uh, Chair, Chair Wall, Commissioner Hyde, uh, we've literally been in a status review since 2018. So that, that process really, you know, it's never re-triggered the five-year clock there. So. Uh, maybe first I just clarify. So the petition that the department received, you know, you know, prior to the deliberations in 2018, that petition, that commission answer, all that process is done. What we're doing now is abiding by that stipulated motion uh, that we would come back and then the commission decided, yes, it is the timing's right. It's been a number of years. There still are those concerns brought forth by constituents and you know, the commission directed us to undertake the status review, a full status review. And so that's where we're at right now. So with the decision uh, in July, uh, you know, to uplist or not to uplist, that then starts that clock again. So within five years, at least, you know, no later than five years, we should undertake again, uh, uh, you know, whether that's a, a kind of a light look or a, a full status review look at, at that species. Commissioner Woolley. Okay. Um, so, I mean, the challenge is we, you know, status review only provides so much information. I mean, as we know, I mean, the species is very difficult to count. And so, you know, I feel that as a commissioner, uh, it's not going to come down so much to you know how many murelets do we think there are, because because nobody really knows. And you know there's at sea counts and you know which are 
kind of speculative and then there are you know inland counts with, that are very difficult to make and so it's really going to be all these other factors that that martin outlined in the beginning you know with with predation with uh, habitat fragmentation and and so on you know that we're going to have to consider you know with climate change you know are these threats uh, serious enough uh, ominous enough you know, for us to make a decision, you know, based on those. And so, I mean, status review, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's not cut and dried like we're, we're counting uh, white-tailed deer or something like that. It, it's just not the same. So um, that just, it's just something to keep in mind. And, and that's why we, we struggled so much with this previously, um, because, you know, we don't know we know ocean conditions are, are variable. Uh, we know that the climate is warming. You know, we know all these things. We know that you know, predation will probably increase with uh, fragmentation of habitat and that sort of thing. And so these are the, the things that are, you know, they're sort of qualitative as well as quantitative that, that we have to consider. So, I mean, that just kind of following up on your point, Commissioner Hatfield Hyde, that you know, weighing the status review, it, I mean, all these other things have to be considered with that. And it's not just, you know, our, is the population, you know, reduced in numbers to the point where they could become extinct. I mean, that, that's not, I mean, that's a legal criteria, but, you know, we have to consider a number of things. And, and Chair Wall, if I could, I, I probably need to make sure I, I keep myself and the staff out of the deliberation you know, front in regards to this this workshop. That certainly is the is the task uh, at hand for each of you individual commissioners, and then as a body. But uh, that that deliberation really is for July. And uh, what what the staff is hoping is that the workshop framework, as well as the materials in there, give you enough decision uh, materials to consider in that deliberation. Thank you for the clarification. Any other questions? Kevin, one that I wanna make sure is when you went past survival guidelines the first time, I was gonna ask you to go back and to that slide and start over, but it seems like we have covered several pieces of that. And I just wanted to make sure that from the questions you've heard, do you feel like there's a general understanding of what you were trying to convey on survival guidelines? Chair Wall, yeah, I think uh, that uh, as the questions came forth, it wasn't about a confusion of what's in front of them. It really was getting down to the detail about what that meant and how do I analyze that, which, which is part of that individual commission and commission body deliberation. So yeah, uh, I, I feel like it was successful today to try to uh, help out with that in a workshop fashion, both uh, introduce the commissioners, uh, uh, both welcoming Commissioner Khalil as well as the others uh, to a, a very, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a one focus commission meeting. So this opportunity really was to introduce you to the bird and then outline that framework. So uh, yeah, I, I think it had, was successful from the staff's perspective. And there are some follow-up legal questions. So those would be in July in exec session? There's yeah, we will, we will work, uh, Chair Wall, we'll work with uh, Michelle Tate in the director's office and uh, get that material back to you. Thank you. One last round, commissioners, anything else you wanna ask? If not, then oh. Just thank, I, I, well, I'd just like to thank thank the staff for putting this on it, it uh, and Commissioner Woolley for pushing this. It was very helpful for me. Thank you. I would yeah, me too, Kevin. I, I appreciate it. I thought it was very well done. I really want to say I appreciate it too. And Kevin, I was really glad because as you were going through the slideshow, I was thinking, okay, we go to step one, we go to step two, then we go to step three, then we go. I, I kept thinking that the slides might came, come at us and keep coming at us of all the steps that we were going to have to go through. So 
it was kind of nice that it um it's pretty it's pretty slow you know it's not 500 steps <laughs> good point i was waiting for that <laughs> Yeah, thank, I thank you a lot. It's very good to go through the legal steps that we have to take, um, you know, as well as that we have to look at the biology um, and the uh, issues that are, are arising with the species. Thank you. And I think that Director Melcher also wanted to make a comment. Thanks. Thanks, Chair Wall. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I, I did. I want to thank the staff as well. We've, you know, we've got a lot of stuff going on over here and waiting for the legislative session to, to end and, and all those things we've been working on. So I appreciate the extra effort. And then just uh, apologies in, my, in the confusion of myself having to reboot my computer at the last minute this morning. I, I wanted to welcome Dr. Khalil as well. And uh, I completely lost my train of thought with the with mayhem. So uh, welcome, Commissioner Khalil, and uh, look forward to working with you here. In the yeah, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, apologies for not asking it. Well, I guess not apologies, but I'm in like sponge mode and everything's a fire hose. And so um, I'm just listening more than talking right now so that I can take things in. Yeah. We've Very all good. been there. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely welcome to you. And yes, we've all... Yeah, I would like to tell you that changes in a couple of meetings, but it doesn't. Um, so thank you, everyone. And unless there are any other questions or comments, with that, we will be adjourned. Thank you. All tomorrow at 8. Thank you.